Hey everybody, welcome to HTM Hackers Hangout. It is Friday, September 1st, 3 p.m. on the west coast of the United States. And today uh, we're gonna be talking about anomaly detection uh, with with Nupic specifically, uh, but also in general with uh, HTM systems. Um, in the uh, Nementa offices, we have uh, Subutai, Ahmad, and Scott Purdy, who are research engineers at Nementa. And um, I'm gonna let Subutai run a good portion of this uh, presentation or this talk because uh, he's got a lot of good resources about anomaly detection. Um, so why don't I just hand it off to you, Subutai, if you're ready. Hey, Matt, um, and new pick. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I thought, well, so Matt and Scott Purdy is here as well. He knows a lot about this stuff. Um, and what we thought we'd do, uh, the three of us talked, is there's a couple of sort of generic questions and general questions that seem to come up quite a bit. Um, so I thought we'd walk through some of that first and then uh, maybe go to some specific questions. And I know Jacob has listed a bunch of them and we can try to go through them and uh, maybe others will have uh, questions as well. Um, so what I we thought we'd start with is just um, going kind of a high level overview of anomaly detection and what are the best practices and how to think about HTM and NUPIC with uh, anomaly detection. Um, and so I'm gonna, uh, let's see, switch to, let's see. Uh, can you see my screen now, Matt? Uh, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so in the beginning, what I'll do is walk through a couple of things that are in a paper that we actually published. So Scott, myself, Alex Lavin, and Zuha uh, Aga was an intern here. Uh, we published a paper. It just came out a few months ago on anomaly detection. And this pretty much has, uh, from an academic standpoint, everything um, that we, we kind of know about HTMs and anomaly detection and streaming anomaly detection in particular, um, all wrapped up into one paper. That includes the includes NAB, which is the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark that we put together. So I thought I'd walk through a couple of things in here first. Um, so um, you know, one question that maybe we should start with is just you know what is anomaly detection um, and what is streaming anomaly detection, which is the thing that we we tend to focus in. Um, so. Um, there's kind of an image here in the paper that uh, shows an example kind of stream of data over time. And this is a typical um, kind of sensor stream that you might see in many industrial applications like Internet of Things and so on. This particular thing is like temperature from a very large industrial machine. And you can see things kind of the, the metric evolving over time, over many months in this case. And the black dots show three anomalies. So what we define anomalies as is something unusual, some unusual pattern in the data given what you've seen uh, so far in the past. And the three black dots here are three anomalies that were actually marked by a human expert and the engineer who works on this machine. Um, and it highlights, you know, some easy examples of anomalies and a really trippy one. So you can see this dot on the left here is a very easy example of an anomaly the reading suddenly dropped, went to zero and then went back up again. So that's clearly an anomaly. It's unusual uh, in this uh, data. And if you look at the very last anomaly on the right-hand side, uh, this is a case where the, the reading dropped. It didn't go all the way to zero, but this was actually turned out a catastrophic failure in the machine. The, uh, there's, the machine basically just broke down and the temperature didn't go all the way back down to zero, but it was significantly lower than the operating normal operating temperature. Um, and what's interesting is this middle anomaly, which is not so obvious. And most traditional techniques actually would not pick, pick up on this, but this anomaly actually preceded the catastrophic failure. So if you look closely, you can see there's some unusual fluctuations in the data um, and that you know you kind of don't see before. I mean, you have to be a bit of an expert to really notice this, but there are uh, unusual fluctuations here. And this kind of highlights what we tend to focus on, which is temporal anomalies. So it's not just that the value at a given point in time is unusual, it's just that the temporal pattern of the data is highly unusual. 
And if you can pick up on temporal patterns, you can pick up on much more subtle anomalies than if you just look at the instantaneous value. And this anomaly is an, a good example of that because there's no, there's no one reading here that's unusual uh, at all. It's really the temporal pattern of, of readings that's, that are unusual. So with HTMs, we focus on these kinds of anomalies, uh, at least in this, in this paper and most of the work we've done uh, so far. Um, we're, look, we're focusing on something we call streaming analytics or streaming anomaly detection. Uh, and the paper has a definition of what we mean. And basically, it's just a continuous stream of readings uh, that is evolving in time. Um, and you, there's no training set or test set. You're just constantly getting data. And you just have to tell at every point in time, is it unusual or not, given what's happened in the past. So this means the system has to be continually learning. It should be unsupervised. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting, as, as sort of noted in this chart here, is you really want to find anomalies as early as possible. Um, it's great to detect this last anomaly on the right, but this is actually after the machine has already broken down. What you ideally want to do is detect the second anomaly here, which is well before the system actually uh, breaks down. Um, so detecting anomalies early is a really big deal. OK, so how would you do anomalies with HTMs? Um, the, what we do, and um, I'll walk you through some code samples as well, um, is we get, if you look at this figure A, we get a stream of data coming in. So x of t is the data at the current point in time. We pass it through an HTM system. Um, we compute uh, something we call the prediction error from that. And sometimes you'll hear the word anomaly score. It's the same thing here. Uh, we're calling it prediction error in the, in the paper. And then from that, we compute something we call the anomaly likelihood, which is, and the anomaly likelihood is what you really should look at to determine whether the system is anomalous or not. And this is a probabilistic measure. It's kind of the probability that the system is in a normal state or one minus the probability that it's in a, in a uh, you're seeing an anomaly. And if you look inside the HTM block, if you're familiar with NUPIC, you'll see some of our familiar components. We have encoders, we have the spatial pooler, and we have the sequence memory or the temporal memory. Those are all inside this block here. Um, so this is sort of how we uh, uh, you know, use do anomaly detection with HTM. So the stream of data goes in. The HTM will model the sequences on the temporal characteristics. And these two other measures here uh, will try to determine given what the HTM is predicting and modeling right now, what is the chance that there actually is an anomaly? OK. Um, so let me switch to some code. Um, I think the, so if you actually want to write code to do anomaly detection, um, I think the best place to start is looking at the sample code that we put together for our benchmark application, which is called NAB, Numenta Anomaly Benchmark. So let me switch to that. Um, probably most of you have seen it, but if you go to github.com slash numenta slash nab, um, this is what we call the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark. Um, and it's got results from lots of different algorithms running uh, anomaly detection. And I'm going to focus in on Numenta HTM here, which does the best in this uh, data set. There's a ton of data in here under the data uh, folder that you can take a look at. And our paper describes all of this in detail. But I'm going to focus in on some of the code. If you go into the NAB directory here, there's code for a bunch of different detectors. And there's code for the Numenta HTM detector. So if you click on Numenta detector.py, it's got pretty short, this is a pretty small file. This shows you how to use NUPIC to do anomaly detection using all of the um, kind of techniques and stuff that we know how to, and sort of the best practice for, for doing it. So let me walk through that code here. Um, so I'm going to switch to my editor. Um, hopefully, this is not too big. You guys can see this is the exact same file, but I'll uh, walk through it uh, line by line. Um, let me jump to the initialize method, which is this short method here that shows you um, how to create the HTM model. Um, so in here, we assume that you know basically the range of values that your data is going to be in. So that's uh, input max and input min. So if you're doing, I don't know, percentages, you'll be between 0 and 100. If you're doing temperature, you might 
be you know between whatever ranges your your system temperature is at. But we assume you know what that is. And then Nupik has this convenient method where if you give it the min and the max, um, it will give you back uh, the best HTM model parameters for anomaly detection. Um, this assumes you have a timestamp associated with your system, so you know timestamp and a value. Um, but I would highly recommend starting with this. Um, it actually took us a quite a long time to figure out the best set of model parameters that works well for anomaly detection, um, and we've tested this on literally hundreds of maybe thousands of data files, um, and this is the the set of uh, parameters that works best across you know, the vast majority of data files that we've tried. And this is also the best set of parameters that works well with NAB. So um, I strongly recommend starting with this set of parameters, even if what you're doing is something slightly different from the way we're doing it. If you start with this and then modify it, you're much more likely to get good results than if you start from scratch. Um, let's see. Um, then there's a method here to set up the encoders. It basically says how to map the names of the fields that are in your data file. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. And then this line will actually create your HTM model. Um, so this is what goes into that HTM block I showed earlier. Um, and this bit of code sets up the anomaly likelihood class um, here. Okay. So this confuses people that they have to enable inference for anomaly models. Ah, OK. Well, you have to enable inference for now. <laughs> what this says is basically, it, because you have multiple fields in here, you have the timestamp fields and the value field, you have to tell the system um, which field is the, key, is the actual value field. And um, I'm not 100% sure why we need this either. Um, because the anomaly score doesn't really use this. Um, so it's a valid point of confusion. But for what, whatever reason, it's you something need that's, It's something hard-coded in uh, OPF, I think. OK, OK. So uh, that's just our bad. Uh, uh, it's part of it's that the OPF is explicitly for prediction problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, I guess we're repurposing a prediction model for this. Um, but um, yeah, in, 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 in theory, this is not really needed. But in, in right now, with our code, it is. Um, that's a valid, valid confusion. Um, with the anomaly likelihood, there are a couple of parameters you need to pass in. Um, you typically, you want to be, you want to have the system learn on a certain amount of data before you start trusting its uh, anomaly you know, uh, likelihood outputs. So this kind of this parameter kind of tells you what that period should be, and usually we find something like a, a few hundred data points or a thousand data points is sufficient uh, for it. Uh, obviously, the longer the better, but in practice, uh, you know, you can't have really long learning periods. So I, I forget in, in NAB, I think it's like two hundred or four hundred or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, so it, it's on that order. Um, OK, I think the rest of it, you, you know, again, you, you should follow, basically follow this code template to set up your anomaly likelihood. And then to run the model, um, when you get input data coming in, you, you send it to the model and you get a result. So this is the output of the HTM block. Um, you get um, the anomaly score, which in our paper we call the prediction score. Um, Prediction error. Prediction error, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip this for a second. I'll get back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, and then you take that uh, anomaly score or prediction error, and you pass it to the anomaly likelihood class, and you get back an uh, anomaly probability, uh, which confusingly we call anomaly score here as well. Um, <laughs> Um, and then uh, we, since this is a probability, probabilistic measure, um, and anomalies are extremely unlikely, um, so it's actually very convenient to work in a logarithmic uh, domain. So we compute, convert the probability into a log likelihood, which is this log score, and then we use that uh, everywhere else in our in our system. Okay. 
Um, so that's the basic flow. Um, we found in practice that um, there's another exception that's very useful to use. Um, and uh, do you want to explain this, or do you want me to explain it, Scott? Um, um, yeah, I can, I can explain it. It's, it's, there's a little comment here. Yeah, so basically the idea is that um, occasionally you have uh, cases where the data is really noisy. So one, one point by itself, no matter how far outside the norm, isn't enough to move the likelihood because the likelihood uses some window. Um, and that is not very intuitive. And a lot of people would come to us and say, hey, why isn't this detecting this very obvious anomaly? It's a, it's a clear spatial anomaly of value way outside the normal range. We've never seen anything like this before. This should be flagged as an anomaly. And so um, we put this, um, this in, and this basically just looks for values um, some amount outside of the range of data that's been seen so far. And, and we'll just sort of, it, it, it's, it's not the most elegant uh, way to address this, but um, it, it basically would just take anything outside of 5% uh, in this case um, of the range we've seen so far and say that that's not an anomaly period, no matter what the likelihood it comes out to. Yeah, and, and in practice, we found that this helps, this incrementally helps the anomaly the overall performance of the system a little bit. Okay. Um, anything else here I should cover? So it's actually pretty straightforward. You know, you, there's an initialization step and a convenient function to get the best model parameters. And then what you have to do is um, run the model and then send the results through the anomaly likelihood. Um, and then use the log version of that uh, to actually do the threshold on. Um, one question we see in the forums quite a bit is, um, you know, what value should I use to, to actually then detect the anomaly? Um, uh, you know, sometimes they say, well, I, the anomaly likelihood is giving me a value like 0.99 and I don't see an anomaly. Um, and that is actually expected. Uh, again, the anomaly likelihood is a very, very, uh, it's a probabilistic measure, and 0.99 means there's a uh, there's a one in a hundred chance that it's an anomaly, that it's an unusual data point, and usually that's actually not sufficiently rare to cause call an anomaly. And what we use is actually five nine, so 0 0.99999 as a threshold, um, and so that's why you see why the log score is helpful. If you convert that to a logarithmic thing, we scaled it so that 0 0.5 is the threshold for an anomaly, for on the, lo uh, the logarithmic of the anomaly likelihood, uh, having a value of 0 0.5 or higher is the best threshold for detecting an anomaly. Um, and that works really well. Okay, so 0.99, if you just look at the anomaly likelihood by itself, is actually not high enough for an anomaly. You need uh, five nines. So, and if you want to plot it, you definitely want to do the log. Yeah, um, yeah. The log will make, as you said, five nines will become a, a 0.5. Um, so anything 0.5 to 1.0 would be considered an anomaly if you're using five nines. And then um, four nines becomes 0.4, I believe. Yeah, um, and it scales down from there. Yeah, exactly. So if you're plotting, plot the log value. It's much more intuitive. Um, to use that, so um, so one one question. So, you know, there's the anomaly score and the anomaly likelihood, and some people often ask, um, well, you know, uh, why am I getting high or low anomaly scores? Um, so I see that question quite a bit, and my basic answer is, uh, don't even look at the anomaly score. Just look at the anomaly likelihood. <laughs> the anomaly score can spike up, or uh, it can be low for it, you know, for, for a short period of time, it does not necessarily mean it's an anomaly. Um, there are some really um, noisy data sets, and um, it's it's impossible to predict any single value. And so, instantaneously, the anomaly score might be high, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a true uh, anomaly. We might actually have examples of that here. Paper. Mm -hmm. Is this a good, ex yeah, here's a good example. Um, 
Yeah, so B there is the prediction error yeah. raw anomaly score. So th this is a real world data set. This is latency on a load balancer in, in a web cluster. And you can see that the latency often spikes up pretty high. This is seconds here. Uh, most of the time, it's pretty low. But you can see that this is completely random. It's very difficult to predict at any point in time whether the latency is going to be high or low. And here's an anomalous situation where um, suddenly the system was slow for some reason, and you get many more uh, low latency requests uh, than, than you would otherwise, or I guess high latency requests. And so here, you're looking at the prediction error or the anomaly score. And you can see every once in a while, it just spikes up high just because it didn't predict this particular value. And that's totally fine. Um, but it is when it's high for a sustained period of time, that's when you should really uh, create and uh, detect an anomaly. And here, uh, you can see that uh, if you threshold on, this is the log likelihood of anomaly. Um, if you threshold on 0.5, you would detect this area as, as anomalous. Okay. What else? Uh, so a lot of the basic things I wanted to cover. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is um, we have a, a sample app on our website called HTM Studio. Um, you might actually want to start with this even before you start coding anything, because this also contains, it contains the same code I showed earlier embedded inside a UI. You can actually um, uh, upload or you just open up one of your data files, uh, and it'll run through the whole process with you and show you in a nice UI where the different anomalies are. And you can uh, read through it here. It's free to download. Um, and I think the source code for this whole app is uh, available as well. Uh, but this this app underneath it does this exact same thing I showed earlier. Um, okay, Matt, anything? What else should I? Uh, yes, yeah, some other themes of questions. Um, I think we already covered this, but I want to let me re emphasize that uh, you don't need to, you shouldn't need to swarm to get anomaly model parameters. Uh, like Subutai said, we already have a good set of them. Um, however, I think some people are trying to do some other things, like uh, they have multiple scalar values that they're they're trying to do multiple fields with timestamps in, in addition to other scalar values. And if if someone wanted to try and, and get better parameters for their specific situation, um, should they should they try and do a swarm? And if is there any way that might help anomaly detection? Or should we just start from those parameters that you identified? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so swarming, we have not found a good way to do swarming with anomaly detection. Um, um, for pre if you're just doing basic predictions, swarming works quite well. But for anomaly, det so what swarming does is finds the best set of parameters that optimizes a particular metric. So prediction error, you can optimize that, and that will give you a good prediction system. But we don't have a good metric for anomaly detection. Um, Specifically, you can't use the anomaly score or likelihood for this. It, that won't work well. Yeah. Um, I actually think that swarming using, if your problem is set up that you, you can frame it as a prediction problem, and there is a variable that is indicative of of your problem that you can um, make the predicted variable and, and swarm based on that. I think that is a good way to approach it. Yeah, so you could you could do a normal prediction swarm and then use the parameters for that. And then um, instead of in that code I showed you, you can use substitute model params from yeah. the swarm. But, but you have to be careful because if you have a data that's very, very, if you have data that's very noisy and inherently hard to predict, then swarming is on that on prediction error is not going to give you a good result. I think so. The latency thing, for example, yeah, okay, it's too so far. You, you just yeah. have to be careful. Um, and yeah. the other thing, just to keep in mind, is that the prediction um, case, your uh, the the way that works is it's optimizing for a specific field. So if you have multiple fields, it's optimizing to predict one of them, and it's going to weight its decision based on the internal values that that actually help it, which might only correspond to some of the fields, not all of them. Um, and so your anomaly score is is different from that. Your anomaly score is based 
on the entire internal state and it doesn't know what parts are which fields. So that's where you have to be a little careful where you might get a good predictive model, but if you look at the entire internal state, it might not actually be a good uh, metric for, for anomaly detection for your application. Mm -hmm. Um, something else, um, that, that paper that you showed earlier, Subutai, um, does it explain how the prediction error, as it's named in the paper, how that is calculated from the internal cellular state of the HTM? Um, yeah, it does do that. Um, okay. that's another common question, so I want to point out that that paper is where you can find out that info. Yeah, yeah, that basically has uh, pretty much everything we know about anomaly detection. So. Here, it's actually the first equation, looks like. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, not a, it's not a super calcul uh, complicated calculation either. No. Um, each of these is, this is like the prediction, uh, the set of cells that, are, that were predicted from the previous time step. And then this is the current set of active cells in the temporal memory. And this is just a normalizing thing. Also, the number. It's the current set of active, it's the number of uh, active columns, actually. Sorry, not the, this is all in columns. Uh, and the, yeah, yeah. The, the simple explanation of this is the, the um, it's the fraction of active columns that were not predicted. Yeah. yeah. Which is why you have the one minus. Yeah. And so this handles multiple predictions. So if you're, if the system is predicting three different things, um, if any of those three occur, uh, the prediction error will be zero. Okay, um, so uh, some other common questions that I think I think we've hit on most of these. We talked about how anomaly detection is related to prediction. We've talked about multiple input streams and how it affects anomaly detection. I was just a little bit confused by what you just said because you said if you're if you're calculating different predictions, um, that it, that could affect the the prediction error. Yes. Yeah, well, it, yeah, so HTM can do multiple, can predict multiple things into the future. So that's one of the kind of nice things about the way that the system represents things using sparse uh, vectors. But, um, you know, say you're flipping a coin, um, heads and tails are both reasonable next steps. So this HTM will be predicting both heads and tails. But if something completely different happens, uh, that wasn't predicted. So that will be an anomaly. So if you're flipping a coin, there's no single prediction that's going to be 100% accurate. You have to be doing multiple predictions. And so with the anomaly detection, if it's either a heads or a tails, it'll say there's no anomaly. But if you have something um, completely different, then it'll call it a, then the error will be high. I think in, in my head, I, I have to stop thinking about predictions as scalar values. You know, th predictions are like the predicted cells within within the system, and all of them are predicting potentially different things in different ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're always predicting lots and lots of things to happen. Um, there's very rare that there's only one possible next thing that can happen. Um, okay, I think we hit the big questions. The the next two things are, you know, Jacob's got his list of of things that we could go through, or we could take questions from those who are currently joined in uh, in the Hangout right now. Let's, uh, let's do that first. Let's see if anybody on the Hangout um, wants to chat or just unmute and and uh, speak your piece. If you have a question about anomaly or a comment about anomaly detection, let us know. Should we start on uh, the ones we have while we're waiting to get more? Sure. So yeah, people uh, on the stream ask questions now while we're covering these, and we'll get to them after. Okay, so yeah, Jacob, type in your questions, uh, or you can wait and ask with your voice after. Okay, Jacob uh, posted a very uh, detailed set of questions, um, which were uh, cool. So we can look at that. Um, I'm going to enter the URL in chat, and I'll put it in the live chat. Okay. Um, so he's not using. Um, I'm gonna uh, enter. <laughs> Jacob just joined. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, Jacob. Um, uh, so 
Uh, hey. So you're not using an anomaly detection, kind of a streaming continuous learning uh, scenario, uh, but more in a, uh, you have a bunch of sequences and you want to see if a new sequence is anomalous or not. Correct. OK. Um, and that, that should be fine. I think, uh, um, the first question, though, is something different. Um, so there's parts of the code that are no longer used, so the anomaly likelihood region and the anomaly auto classifier. Um, the, yeah, they are not used in the NAB example today. Um, the anomaly likelihood region, the anomaly likelihood is kind of uh, computed after the fact, but someone, uh, you know, ultimately it could be a region that's included in the network, and then you wouldn't have to do that extra calculation. But I think this is still in process and not complete. Is that correct, uh, or is that? I think it no, works. I think it, it works. It, it yeah. works. Okay, yeah, but it was, for some uh, reason, I think it was just added after. So oh, it was added after. Now. Yeah, we okay. just haven't switched over to it. Um, wasn't this Mark's uh, PR? This was his work. Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be. And I think I think he was trying to add different types of computations here, um, which I think we want to just put in what, what we've sort of proven works, and then people are welcome to create their own regions to do whatever they want. Uh, again, to use this, you would be working at the network API level as opposed to using the OPF model. Um, the OPF model handles this um, in a different way. Um, it, it could use this, but it yeah. doesn't happen to be using it right now. And then the anomaly classifier, or do you have more to say on the? Like, yeah, I was going to say that eventually, if we use the the region to do it, it would make the client code simpler, mm -hmm. uh, much less. Uh, so it'd be nice to put in. Um, yeah, the classifier. Yeah, so that we had when we. A long time ago. When, yeah, when we were building an application with this, and we ran into this problem that. Um, one thing that's not that people sometimes don't like is that if you see something that's an anomaly in your data and that corresponds to some bad thing that happened in the real world, like if this is um, a sensor on a piece of machinery, if the machinery broke and you, and it, you detected an anomaly leading up to it, it might be useful to detect that anomaly in the future as well. But the way the anomaly detection works is if you see that multiple times, eventually it's going to be learned as normal behavior. And so we wanted the ability for people to say, hey, this anomaly right here is something I want to know about in the future, even if it starts looking like a normal behavior. Even though it's not really a true anomaly anymore, it's, uh, it's something I want to know about. And so we kinda, it, it's kind of a way of using anomalies as a way to alert you of unusual behavior the first time. And then this is a way for you to, to keep track of when it happens again in the future. Mm -hmm. And so this classifies. Uh, the state internally that, that caused the anomaly so that if we see that state again in the future, even though it won't look like an anomaly um, to the anomaly algorithm, it will we'll still be able to tell the user, hey, this thing happened again. Yeah. Does it work, and, though? Or do you um, not use it? No, we haven't used it. I think there's some challenges with it. Um, so one big thing is that um, it's very rare that you're going to see the exact same sequence again. and uh, want to class uh, and want to classify that. So, if you think about, you know, this example that I was showing earlier. So this here might be an um, a pattern that you want to classify again, but it's unlikely to look ex like this. Uh, it might be quite different. And so, you know, how you classify a sequence um, is actually quite a tricky problem. And I think in general, it's an unsolved problem in, in machine learning. Um, you know, you want to classify maybe things that are quote unquote similar to this pattern, but not exactly, might, doesn't have to be exactly the same. So, um, so, you know, so, so basically, it, if there was a, some kind of machine failure that caused some sequences here that we detected as anomaly one time, um, that same failure can cause similar but different sequences as well. So yeah. essentially, you'd have to classify the same thing multiple times in yeah. order to have a robust classifier for it, yeah. which might be fine for some people, but in other cases, might be yeah. tedious. And in general, we have not done too much. We've done a little bit of work, but not too much on sequence classification with HTMs. So I think within the HTM community, this is an unsolved problem. How do you take a sequence of patterns and even with multiple training sets be able to classify it uh, robustly? Um, so that that's sort of a I would say it's like a research area. 
um, anything. So we, we typically have not used this too much. But you're welcome to try it and, um, and improve it. Because uh, I think you know, we've done anomaly detection, we've done prediction, we have not really done sequence classification. And that would be a really nice third leg to have in, in, in this uh, you know, trio of capabilities. Yeah, it'll be needed, but I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> we're, we're putting your name down for it. So yeah. You're on the hook. <laughs> Do you, do you think any, any of the work that uh, that we've done, like that Marion did, it would be helpful? I think she's yeah. added open source. Uh, yeah, it could be. There's there's stuff in HTM research on it. I don't know how well commented it is um, um, and stuff, but yeah, there, there's definitely some work that that we've done on it. Um, but the basic conclusion is it was a difficult problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, you're right that this would disable it. I think this only looks at um, values that are above this threshold. And since the highest value you can get is 1.0, it would basically ignore everything if you do this. Um, can you do swarming for anomaly detection? I think we, we answered that already. Um, so multivariable anomaly detection. You don't use time of day, which is, that's fine. You don't have to. Um, and it, it seems like uh, you have to add multi-channel data to give the contextual clues for anomaly detection. Um, yeah, so, so basically, if you have multiple fields coming in and you want to do anomaly detection, um, there are a couple of different options um, that we played around with. Um, one of them is simply to do a completely separate um, anomaly model for every single field. Um, and then if any of them give an anomaly or uh, two of them give an anomaly, then you say it's, it's an anomaly. Uh, so that's, that's one possibility. Um, you could uh, feed in all the data into a single spatial pooler and then do our normal anomaly detection. Um, I found that that works okay for a few fields, but the amount of training data you need to train the spatial pooler and the temporal memory will grow um, pretty fast as you add in more and more fields. And so, yeah, do you, you have can a, do. Do you have a rule of thumb for the number of inputs and the amount of training required? Um, it's dependent on the underlying dimensionality of the data. So this, this, so it's hard to give a rule of thumb. The, the, if, if you, the, the space increases exponentially as you add in more and more uh, fields. So um, it could be that you need that the amount of data grows exponentially. But usually, real world data will fall in some lower dimensional manifold in that space. So it's a function of that underlying dimensionality. So theoretically, you could have like 20 inputs, but if all the data is correlated together in like a single dimension, yeah. then it would, it would be tractable. Exactly, exactly. And, and what some people have done in the past, uh, and we've also done this, is you could just run principal components on the data, trim it down to a smaller number of fields, and then feed that to a, a spatial pooler. So if you have real world, if you have scalar values, that's something you can do. Um, so, okay, yeah. yeah, keep going. Yeah, so that could be a tip if you, you ask for tips, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Um, well, well, one of the comments in that question was, um, so you can, if you put input correlated data, it's not going to increase the dimensionality of the of the problem, right? Right. How, right. So, but don't you want correlated data for anomaly detection, or do you want, you know, orthogonal data? Yeah. So with the HTM, what we're doing is um, we're making predictions into the future. Um, so data that's correlated at a particular point in time is not going to help too much. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but the spatial pooler should dedupe it anyway. Yeah, it should dedupe. So, um, and, but what you want is data that's correlated in time. So if you have something at time t minus one that's correlated with another variable at time t or t plus one, that would be a useful field to put in. So if you have x correlated variables coming in and 
know, XI decides it wants to go its own way, is that going to pop up? Or you say it's you say it's not correlated. It, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. Try to understand. Yeah. Yeah. You you. Um, so if you have a bunch of variables that are correlated, and then another one sort of goes off somewhere else, then what you'll get is you'll get a few bits in the spatial cooler that will be quite different from what it's seen before, and you you should get a little bit of an um, you, you might get a slight anomaly in the so uh, just uh, only a slight anomaly, not a huge anomaly. Yeah. So it's if let's say you have five variables in there and one of them is slightly off. Um, the spatial pooler, I think, is somewhat resistant to noise, and you'll see just a few bits difference in the spatial pooler. Um, and the temple memory is looking at the spatial pooler output, um, so it might not detect um, a huge difference there. So uh, what if we wanted to um, increase the sensitivity to that kind of case? OK. Um, so if you if you know what field that is, you could have a higher resolution, um, or not higher resolution. You can allocate more bits to that encoder. So it's the it's the size of the input that, that affects the uh, magnitude of the anomaly score. It affects the output of the spatial pooler, um, which in turn will uh, affect the pre how well the temporal memory can predict those bits. So um, yeah, so when you're yeah. when you're selecting encoders, you're kind of already pre-selecting winners about what's going to be anomalous and what's not. Yeah, we tend to keep them all equal. Um, that's worked well. Uh, but again, we you know we haven't really done a lot with more than two or three variables. And, and it's the number of active bits, not the total bits for the encoder that matters. I yeah. understand. It's the W value. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's it's very helpful. Okay. Yeah, I would. I always start with the when thinking about anomaly detection. When I was debugging and tuning all this stuff, I would start with the spatial pooler, um, and think about what would affect the spatial pooler the most, and or, or what will cause the spatial pooler to do the right things. Um, and that, and if if that isn't done correctly, nothing after that is going to work well. Um, and so, you know, particularly if you're deviating from the stuff we've already tried and worked, I think I would start with understanding the spatial pooler, and then uh, the temporal memory does predictions on the bits that are coming out of the spatial pooler. I'm going to do four. Huh? Okay. You're going to do four? Okay, yeah, four now. go for it. Uh, so the question number four here is um, in the absence of correlated signals, uh, specifically talking about when you start a new sequence, um, basically it's just, I think this is a statement more than a question, but um, you can create your own start signal that is a unit step function in this scalar encoder. And I think what this is getting at is that if you are in the middle of a, a sequence and then you transition to a different sequence without warning, then the, the model will... Um, have will say will give a really high anomaly score because it's not expecting the new uh, sequence, um, and that one way to get around this is to put sort of a random element. Um, in this case, it's not random, but it's basically making sure it's uh, some element in between the sequences that will break up and kind of break the model out of its um, predictive state from the previous sequence. And so, what, another way to do this is just to re to give a reset to the model. So, model dot reset will basically get rid of the, the current state and just start from scratch. Um, and so that should do the same thing as putting a unit set function in. Yeah, that's it's kind of um, what I had to develop, because I'm not using streaming data. I'm just using fixed data sets. And the, yeah. and yeah, the so, sequence doesn't always start at t equals 0, so I don't always know where the, to do reset sequence states. Oh, I, I see. Interesting. Uh, so it, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, because if if uh, I mean, assuming that the sequences are things that recur that happen multiple times, that the model is going to see multiple times, then it will it will learn the sequence and things that are noise in between occurrences of se of predictable sequences will will just be considered noise. So I, I'm not sure I understand if you 
it sounds like you know when the sequence is starting. Otherwise, you wouldn't know how to when to put in your start signal, right? Well, there's there's three different types of start signals. There's the implicit start, which is at t equals zero, and then there's like the generated start, where you use some kind of detector to figure out where where you actually where the event you're interested in occurs. And then there's the third one, which you say if your your whatever your 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 natural data, if you have some sort of uh, natural start signal that comes in on a different channel. And so I've tried di all different approaches, hmm. and so the generated is not always you know accurate, but it, it's it's useful if you can get a natural start signal from whatever process you're studying. Yeah. So my recommendation is if you can if you have a start signal like that 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 you you know works well is to use the reset functionality, um, which is simpler than putting in, uh, you know, the, using the unit sub function. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing is I just synchronized all of my data sets. Mm -hmm. And they all started at t equals zero. Okay. okay, that works too. Yeah, that, that's good. Because, um, uh, yeah, otherwise it's just something else the system has to learn to predict. Um, so Although I did, I did spend a lot of time um, on not having the start signal, and I, and <laughs> I actually, <laughs> I actually got very, um, I got very good at predict or not or uh, detecting anomalies on things that start at random times. So, because because when you just have a data set and and the sequence starts at some time, it's always going to be anomalous at the beginning because it yeah. was not expecting it. Exactly. Exactly. So I had to provide that contextual information. But then you know, just eventually I realized, oh, I just set it at t equals zero, if yeah. I can do it. But that's not always possible. Yeah. Another thing is, uh, if you're using the anomaly likelihood, if you know that the sequence has just started and things are going to be anomalous, you, you may not want to pass that into the anomaly likelihood. I'm not sure. There's anomaly scores. Um, otherwise, it's going to think it's a very noisy. Um, stream. I forget if we had a reset function in the anomaly likelihood. I don't think so. Nope, you have to destroy it and create a new one. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is if you destroy and create a new one, you have to retrain the whole thing, and it takes a few hundred data points to retrain the likelihood well, model. Yeah, there, yeah, you can do a, a Python pickle and, and restore it that way. Oh, okay. Yeah, you could do that. You could do that. At the end of the day, the anomaly likelihood is just a Gaussian, so there's only two numbers you need, um, the mean and the variance inside it. Oh, no, but it keeps the whole history, I think. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch yeah. of stuff in there, so yeah, yeah. I, don't, I try not to concern myself with the details. OK. <laughs> OK, so in your training set, you have a handful of normal examples. So eight, by eight, you mean eight sequences. Is that right? Correct. Um, and then each sequence you train uh, with 20 repeats. Right. Um, and then at the end of each training run, you do a reset. So you're not resetting between sequences? No, I resetting? am. I oh, am. You are. OK. So at the end of each sequence, you call reset. Yeah, so that would be 100 resets. Or no, 80, 8 times 20 is 160 yeah. resets. Yeah, yeah, OK. That, that seems fine. That seems good. Um, I don't know if that was but a I, question. But that, but that, I, that, I, yeah, so that's just a statement. But I actually figured out, you know, it has it should be non-interleaving because I actually try to interleave tr the training, and it doesn't seem to pick up on the uh, the sequences very well. Hmm. That's weird. Well, if you're doing well, a maybe, reset in between, it shouldn't matter. Oh, uh, maybe maybe I'll try it again. Maybe I was using bad parameters at the time. Okay. Yeah. Um. How do I learn long sequences effectively? Um, so the num number of repetitions uh, you need to learn a long sequence is um, two times the length of the sequence multiplied by um, how, how high order, the, the order of the sequence. <laughs> So that's the technically correct answer. So let me try to unpack that. So there's high order sequences, which means there are sequences which share common elements. Um, 
And if you have common elements in there, let's say you have at most three shared elements in sequences that are 10, 10 elements long, then you'll need to learn it about two, each, you'll have to do about six repeats of the whole sequence, okay, two times three. Um, and so the, the, the more long-term context you have uh, in, in the sequences, the longer uh, the training time has to be. So uh, in, in my question, it was, I've got a handful of sequences. Um, some of them share commonality. Mm -hmm. How can yeah. I, how long does it take to train to learn that commonality? And so then I can say uh, any, any, uh, any new sequence that comes along can fit into this family is nominal or anomalous. Anomalous. Um, yeah, are these, are these all discrete? Is this discrete data or scalar just as a? Scalar data. Oh, scalar data, OK. Um, so yeah, I use the, you know, the, the width W yeah. um, to try and uh, you know, share, share input bits to mm -hmm. try and generalize the sequences. But of course, okay. that makes it less sensitive to anomalies. Yeah. But, so uh, if you're, yeah. If you're training each sequence with twenty repeats, I think that should be pretty good. But uh -huh. um, is it is it living? Okay. So if I get to like t equals um, ten, and at this point, like half of the sequences have one number and half of the sequences have another number, but they're partially overlapped. Can we jump from one sequence to, to, to the next? If we meet, reach that midpoint, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so if, if, if you have um, you know, a sequence like A, B, C, D, E, F, and another sequence like uh, W, X, B, C, Z, something like that, so they, they share two elements. Um, if you do enough repeats, it'll keep track of which one. So if you start with A, B, C, it's going to predict D. And if you start with so, W, X, you know, B, C, it's going to predict Z. So if we make it a scalar example, suppose we have a sequence uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.9, and another sequence 0 0.6 and 0 0.1. Uh, is it possible to jump from one sequence to the other if they're sharing input bits? What do you mean by jump from one to the other? So if so, if I get it, so if I get a new input zero point five, yeah, um, the previously learned sequences are zero point four and zero point six. So the, there's there's partial overlap there. Oh, we, I... Are we are we predicting both branches, both sequences? Uh... So it depends on your resolution, resolution of the encoder, but you should be able to do either one, actually. If you, so if you have a very high resolution encoder, 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 might be completely different. Um, in that case, it won't predict anything. But if you have a coarse enough encoder, they'll be very similar. And it, if in the limit, it's going to predict both 0.9 and 0.1. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering about the trade-off about you know what's what's the trade-off for making a you know a wide input or a larger W, so you can make those transitions if you have a large W, but what are you sacrificing? Um, like the, you're, you're sacrificing the sensitivity. I know. Yeah, you're Anything else? The precision there. Uh, so I mean that that's an application question. I, I don't know what you want in your scenario. Okay, I'm just yeah. curious. But it, you you do have the flexibility to tune that. Sure. Um, okay, I know we're getting close to four. Um, before we get to uh, the stuff, are there any other questions that we should, uh, before we, uh, we can answer Jake's questions, but uh, I know we're getting close to four now. All right. Oh, okay. Not not a question from Glenn, but he's happy he has the opportunity to. Uh, okay, thank you, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I told everyone here, it's really I I love what you guys are doing, and I appreciate it when they have questions. Great. Awesome, awesome. Does anyone in chat want to want to just speak up and with any questions before we go back and do the rest of Jacobs? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Right. Uh, we can go through here. Okay, so we talked about long sequences. Um, so PEM length backtrack. <laughs> so this is a really old version of temporal memory that you're using, not the latest. Well, which, well that's fine. Uh, no, well, what I would say is you're making it sound like it's like uh, inferior, um, but it's our it is our production and and most accurate most uh, performant both as far as for that's true for anomaly detection it is actually results in yeah, um, maybe not for. so I think it's a I think I would it's what I would recommend somebody use if they want to get the best results but uh, our our research is using a newer version that is a little close to biology doesn't have some of these optimizations in it um, so PAM length isn't a thing in the new one but um, that's where your comments coming from right um, yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, so you guys have a, an internal version that you use, or is it's, it? Uh, it's, uh, a it's in NuPic as well. It's in NuPic as well. There's there's um, temporal memory .py and temporal memory. In our research code, we also have another version which is very similar. With, you know, we're doing things like feedback and um, uh, sensory motor stuff with temporal memory. So we have a slightly different version of the code in our research repository. But I just emphasize, if you're just trying to get good anomaly detection results, I think this is yeah. the right way to go. Okay, so Scott, Scott's going to answer your questions about <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so can you explain how these work? Uh, you Basically, you've played around with these, and they seem to affect your results. Um, and it'd be nice to have some guidance on what they mean so you can, it can better inform your experimentation, I think, is what you're asking here. Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> Should we punt to Chaitin's video? Chaitin had a whole video on this stuff. Yeah, that would be what good to post it? that afterwards. Um, that would be good. Just uh, we don't have time to really go into this, but the sim simple version of what these things mean. Um, uh, so max inf is uh, inference, and max learn is learn, uh, and it's a the number of the maximum number of steps that you can backtrack. And this is a an optimization in this implementation of temporal memory where when its predictions are not correct, it will basically go back multiple steps until it can pick up a sequence that it could have followed that would have been correct. Yeah, I think is that essentially correct? Yeah. So, exactly. so basically there are, yeah, it essentially does something like that. And then PAM length is, is a, a variable that's used for determining how long to extend sequences in each pass. Um, so yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier that with high order sequence you do to do multiple repeats. Uh, having a higher PAM length kind of avoids some of those repeats. It, it, um, it sort of greedily tries to learn high order sequences. And, and so you're right that PAM length of 100 would mean like it thinks, okay, m sequences uh, are very, very high order and I'm just going to keep thinking this is a new uh, high order sequence. Um, and the problem is that if there's noise in the data, it's going to learn all of the noise as each kind of noisy sequence as its own high order sequence. So this may explain why you're finding that it's very brittle in, in generalization. So it's, uh, yeah, it's you, kind of a trade off. You basically there. figured out this variable on your own, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I'm looking through the code too. OK. Yeah. So I, I want to stress you know, this stuff is, uh, these are optimizations that were put in to get it to learn quicker in some situ scenarios. and. It, these are not necessarily biologically uh, accurate. Um, although I think Jeff thinks there, there could be a biological analog to Pamlet as well when you're just trying to memorize something and you know you're trying to memorize something. That's all the justification I need. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of how we were, we put it into. Um, okay, selecting the scale. I think we. Did we talk some? So we talked about resolution. Um, you know, to me, it really, uh, if you're diving into the details of what's going on, I, I always start with the spatial pooler, making sure it's behaving correctly as far as resolution goes. Um, I don't know if there's a question here. Encoder selection for anomaly detection. 
just for the sake of time, um, we've we've talked about how encoders are are important. Uh, you have to get your you have to capture the semantics correctly in your encoding and get the right proportions of uh, bits and whatnot. Um, Delta encoders definitely try them out, see if they help or not. Uh, they might they might work. In some cases, you might only need a delta encoder and not even need a scalar encoder. Um, normally, we find the scalar encoder. We start with that, and then mm -hmm. um, delta encoder might help. But you just have to experiment. Yeah, in, in NAB, we we found scalar encoder works best across all the data sets. Um, you know, all the kind of industrial data sets that we've we've tried on. Um, delta encoder. Um, the one case where I found it was useful is when you have a, a data that's con continuously increasing and continuously decreasing, um, and it's really the, the changes that are more important, um, the, the magnitude of the change. So it, if it's continuously increasing, the system will never really predict it because it's always a new data point. But it's the magnitude of the change that was more important. Uh, for the vast majority of data that I've seen, scalar encoders, this works much better. Yeah, and you have this note about you, you just built your own delta encoder by taking the difference and feeding that as an input to a scalar encoder. That's that's fine. Um, I, I'm a little surprised that the that's not what the regular delta encoder is doing, but I haven't looked at that in a while. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Um, OK, so here's training the same fixed input over and over again. Completely learn the sequence, and the anomalies could be, should be 0. Um, yeah, there was a situation where we would occasionally see get missed predictions, right? Um, even training the same value over and over again. Um, right. I could probably dig up uh, an old experiment to try and you know recreate that situation, but okay. theoretically it should flatten out no matter what, no matter what the parameters are, right? Uh, how many? How many? Um, I wouldn't say no matter what the parameters are. What? How many records are we talking about? Like how many iterations did you do? Um, I think uh, like maybe four hundred data points, and then I think I just I trained it like hundreds of times. I think I did it overnight one time. It didn't make any difference. Um, cause I, I could think if it's like combining sequences, but uh... yeah, I mean, if you're giving it the same value over and over again, it actually does well, not know what the order of the sequence well, is. It's, it's reset. Well, you re you reset every time. So how long is the sequence? Four hundred. Just like six hundred points. Oh, six hundred points, and you do a reset. At, so it's the same value for six hundred times, then you do a reset. No, the same then... value, the same sequence. 400 long or 600 long. Oh, oh! I thought this was the same fixed input. Oh, oh! Maybe I misinterpreted that. Is no, this, no, um, no, no. Scott's right. It's okay. a it's a 600 uh, value sequence, and you, and you just input it over and over and over and over. Again. So and theoretically, it should learn it. Yeah. Um, if it's a single sequence over and over again, it should it should learn it. I wouldn't say no matter what the parameters are, though. I think that you, you want to stay. If you do, if you get this with the uh, parameters that come out of NAB, I would be interested. That that would be surprising. All right, I'll re I'll review to see. I'll I'll look at those NAB parameters and look at my past past work. I was probably monkeying around with like permanences and learning rates, which is probably a bad thing. Yeah, I mean you can. That's you should be. You definitely fine. should be able to learn this so that it just the number goes flat. Um, there, yeah, there's a possibility that maybe you're you're you are oscillating somewhere with the the too high of a decrement relative to the increment or something like that. Yeah, I also had uh, was it uh, I turned on boosting. I think it was, which was not good for anomaly detection. Oh, because yeah. of <laughs> constantly spiking anomaly scores. Yeah, it took me a while to figure that one out. Yeah, for anomaly detection, we pretty much have boosting off. Although uh, UA has put in a, uh, an improved boosting method, so it's a little bit better behaved now. But um, you, you don't want stuff. You don't want the spatial pooler suddenly changing underneath you when you're doing anomaly detection. Yeah. It's 
Correct. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it looks like uh, Matt posted the link to Chaitin's video. If you want to understand Pamela and then backtracking in detail. I think that's it. It was the one called CLA. Some, it says something about CLA. Okay. But it's, he was talking about the backtracking TM. And just to be clear, in, in NuPic, in the code, the, the production version of TM, we're, we're calling backtracking TM. And the one we use in research is just temporal memory. And if you see references, the, the one that's currently called backtracking TM has had previous names. So <laughs> backtracking TM is synonymous with uh, tp.py or tp10x2.py. Those were just the Python and C++ versions of it. Um, yeah. Well, how Hopefully, you like the new names better. <laughs> Where is the, oh, yeah, backtrack. Yeah, I see. Yeah. PM and um, uh, OK, so we're way over time. And we got through everything, I think. Um, everybody had a chance to ask, ask questions. Uh, so I think this is a, another HTM Hackers Hangout in the bag. Uh, we didn't really talk about anything except anomaly detection. So the next Hangout will just be a, a standard one. Uh, but I really appreciate Supatai and Scott taking their time to uh, answer these questions and, and you guys on the forums for, for laying them out. Um, so we could uh, walk through them. Uh, I hope we can refer to this video and other anomaly detection questions that come up so that when others have similar questions. And that's about it. Here's a treat for those of you who stuck around the whole time. Here's my new brain model. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really happy with my new brain model. The old one that Jeff gave me was just old and dirty and it had glue in it. It was glued can, together. can you send me the link for that, Matt? Because I, I bought one recently, and it's really small, but it doesn't doesn't come apart into that many pieces. And so, yeah, sure. Uh, so I bought a cheap one from the same company for like thirty five dollars, but it was just really bad, and I sent it back. So this one's not so cheap, but it's a good model. But uh, anyway, um, that's it for HTM Hackers Hangout. Uh, thank you for joining us one more time. Anybody has anything? Here's your chance to speak up. That's a wrap. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.